page of my talk. Um, great. And I hope you can also problem. see the slide as I change and move forward. Uh, right, okay. Great. Well, today's talk will be pretty much about gentrification, obviously. Um, what I try to cover in the next 40 to 50 minutes will be um, uh, five points. So I'll start by looking at why gentrification has become important and why I feel it's also important in Asian context. Uh, I'll then move on to discuss uh, briefly about understanding gentrification as an endogenous process rather than something that has been imported from the West. I also uh, subsequently talk about the need of understanding gentrification uh, together with other urban processes at work. The next topic will be about uh, the question of whose perspectives count in the discussion of gentrification, especially looking at some of the examples coming from south southern China where urban redevelopment has been rampant in urbanized villages. Lastly, lastly, I talk about the need of complicating displacement, given that displacement is very much a central theme to the question of gentrification. I try to understand and share the, uh, some of the ideas about the scale and temporality of displacement um, in studying gentrification. And then I try to conclude uh, um, by summarizing uh, some of the key points and also some questions for further uh, discussions. Well, the, this graph shows uh, the Google uh, Ngram viewer based um, um, uh, summary of you know, how frequently gentrification uh, has appeared in English publications since 1950s or since the, uh, or since the 1960s up until recently. And as you can see, I mean, it has gone through you know, several round of you know, uh, escalation. So uh, 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 an increase in the number of you know, uh, uh, publications you know, throughout the 1970s and 80s. And then again, the, uh, 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 a bit of surge uh, towards the, uh, the end of 1990s. And, and, and again, a continuous increase in a rapid pace you know, throughout the 2000s. So this is probably something you, uh, would have seen and also felt, and as you walk, as you browse the uh, uh, the browse libraries or or, or the bookshops, um, uh, where you get to see a lot of you know, new uh, articles emerging uh, that discuss gentrification, not only in the West but also obviously in other non-Western contexts as well. I would start by saying that uh, such uh, an increasing uh, interest in gentrification throughout the uh, uh, second half of the 20th century uh, does coincide with the uh, changes in urban structure in the West. So many of you who, are, who have read gentrification literature will be familiar with also the urban uh, studies literature on the changing urban governance from managerialism to urban entrepreneurialism and also the rise of neoliberalism uh, in the West, especially from the 1970s onward, uh, which was kind of also accompanying the rise of uh, uh, global cities uh, as financial capital and also the proliferation of property-led regeneration that was pre pretty much emphasizing uh, physical upgrading rather than uh, social upgrading. So in a much uh, spending of the government has, uh, has been made on uh, physical renovation to, uh, to build cities for visitors and investors rather than um, um, providing uh, subsistence uh, and uh, support for their population um, and so on. Now, when you actually also look at the uh, um, uh, discussion in the critical urban studies literature, especially the work of David Harvey and Anne Lefebvre, uh, we get to understand how uh, in recent decades, uh, the capitalist economists have seen what is known as the secondary circuit of capital accumulation, which refers to basically the, uh, the accumulation of fixed assets and consumption funds 
which uh, the latter that has been increasingly uh, subject to commodification. So when you kind of look at the, uh, the relationship between primary circuit as industrialization and the secondary circuit as urbanization or the secondary circuit of the built environment, we get to see in many post-industrial cities that have seen the snowballing of industrial and production capacity to, um, to other places, uh, other regions of the world, such as Asia. So in you know, Western Europe, for example, and has, uh, or North America, seeing uh, a lot of in you know, a relocation of their production capacities to elsewhere, leading to uh, the rebuild, the need of rebuilding cities as they transform their in industrial structure. Uh, accommodating more uh, activities of service economy and, is, uh, and of course, in the financial uh, uh, capitalism. Which, and then what, what this also means in the West, uh, in non-Western context, especially in Asia, is, uh, and here um, we are also uh, focusing on East Asia in particular, especially in the second half of the 20th century, which uh, has risen to be the receiving, receiving end of such relocating production capacities, building up their industrial potential, and actually becoming the uh, um, emergent exporters of, of commodities. But it's also quite interesting here is how much this secondary circuit has become quite important, not only for expanding the industrial production capacity in Asian context, but also um, accumulating um, a large amount of fixed assets in the forms in the forms of product, no, uh, the production facilities, um, but also um, in the forms of real estate as well. So towards the end of 19th, uh, 20th century, we get to see many Asian economies increasingly seeing um, uh, uh, the rise of secondary circuit of uh, the built environment. And here, the, uh, uh, the urban political economy increasingly uh, depending on uh, the portion of real estate economies, especially among those cities which have become quite in a, uh, central to national economies. And when you also look at uh, the secondary circuit itself, um, as I was saying briefly earlier, uh, we can think of the built environment for production that support the, uh, uh, the industry, industry production and also the built environment for consumption. And what is very noticeable about the emerging discourse of gentrification is uh, the ways in which this built environment for consumption, which has become increasingly subject to commodification of land and housing, uh, has been very much in a, uh, connected closely uh, with the ways in which uh, our communities and neighborhood have changed. Um, and here, the key to this uh, uh, emergence of gentrification is the competition for space, which uh, uh, Alvin Wiley has emphasized in his publication in 2017, uh, which results in, result in, uh, um, in the uh, displacement of people from their community through the process of you know, what is known as unhoming. Uh, and here, uh, unhoming, uh, uh, building upon uh, uh, the findings of uh, uh, Atkinson, Roland Atkinson in 2015, uh, as well as Elliot Cooper, uh, um, Herbert and Lees uh, in their publication that came out in 2020. So the built environment for consumption that has become increasingly subject to commodification, largely uh, leading to this uh, 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 prevalence of uh, uh, the, uh, in the emerging conditions of gentrification across the world. And when you look at this, um, um, together with the change in structure of sector, uh, in, uh, the, uh, the change in structure of the industry, especially the manufacturing sector, um, and we, when you kind of think of how in the UK context, gentrification has become uh, much more noticeable in, in the second half of the 20th century, with the rise of London as the financial capital, and also you know, with the uh, transition of UK economy into a post-industrial um, economy. Uh, we get to see in a, a bit in a evidence here uh, in the first graph uh, that you see on the screen where the share of the uh, economically active population in, in uh, working in manufacturing declining very sharply 
from the 1980s, um, well, from the 90s, uh, 70s and 80s onward. And this also you know, shows you know, how important it has become uh, to uh, transform uh, cities uh, to cater for new types of investors that have arrived at, uh, at the UK. When you also compare this with, uh, for example, an uh, Asian economies like China, and we all get to hear about how China has become very much influential in the uh, manufacturing, uh, 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 in, in the manufacturing industry. What is quite interesting is you know, China also is seeing increasingly uh, the decreasing rate of uh, the decreasing share of economically active population uh, working in manufacturing. So China's high point, according to uh, a study by Evans and Stein, uh, uh, um, Schweinsteiger uh, in 2009, uh, basically uh, uh, find out that in the China's high point in for, for the share of the uh, uh, population in manufacturing was sometime in mid 1990s when it was recording 14.4 percent, and subsequent in subsequent years uh, going through a decrease. Uh, whereas the uh, the share of the population engaging in service industry uh, has been increasing uh, very uh, rapidly. So this also kind of uh, shows and how much you know, it has become important uh, to think about the rising importance of secondary circuit of capital accumulation and especially the way in which Chinese uh, cities have gone through uh, a very profound changes you know, initially to become uh, the centers of manufacturing industry uh, uh, contributing to the rise of China as the global uh, factory of commodities. Uh, but then subsequently going through a series of changes um, uh, to make uh, 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 to give rise to the importance of uh, the built environment becoming the one of the major contributing factors you know, for thinking about economic development. All of these, especially you know, uh, the rise of secondary circuit related discussions uh, will be basically telling us the fact that um, the world has gone through um, what, it, what can be seen as a uh, real estate turn, especially Asia, um, given, their, uh, given the continent uh, very rapid pace of development has seen this uh, real, real, uh, the real estate turn in their uh, uh, economy and urban uh, politics uh, very sharply pronounced. And this is what Gavin Shakin from the US has, has been trying to argue in his publication in 2017. Such real estate turn can also be seen um, in other parts of the world, especially in the global south. So for example, uh, Tom Gillespie uh, in his publication in 2020, which was discussing the experience of Accra in Ghana, uh, basically emphasizing how um, uh, such an African city like Accra has also seen the rise of what is known as what he uh, coins as real estate frontier, which is basically characterized by the incremental and contested commodification of state land to enable the growth of the real estate sector in the city. And this also uh, can be uh, very much related to what uh, Tom Goodfellow in 2017 was referring to as uh, real estate, um, uh, the rise of real estate in the context of late urbanization in Africa. Or what uh, Seth Schindler has been trying to uh, uh, emphasize by coining uh, the expression territorial moment of urban governance. All of these are basically trying to uh, suggest um, the importance of real estate, especially the secondary circuit of the built environment that uh, um, um, has been very, uh, pretty much contributing to the growing uh, importance of various conditions that would enable the rise of gentrification. Just going back to China's context very briefly, you know, I was just saying that China's, Chinese cities has been transitioning a lot from uh, becoming the centers of manufacturing industry into um, um, uh, cities that would also emphasize the accumulation of you know, fixed assets in real estate and housing as well as urban amenities. This is very much an uneven process, by the way, as indicated by this graph here, uh, or by this figure, where the previous centers of uh, manufacturing uh, uh, industry 
increasingly uh, uh, seeing uh, their relocation to uh, inland regions. So Beijing, Tianjin, or Shanghai, or the you know, Pearl River, uh, or the cities uh, uh, and con uh, counties in Pearl River Delta region uh, would see uh, increasingly the relocation of uh, some of their uh, production capacities to inland regions, while uh, the uh, these cities in the eastern uh, coastal areas increasingly turning into um, somewhat uh, that can be seen uh, to some extent uh, uh, quite similar to what post-industrial cities in the West may uh, depict. So such kind of a situation creates very uneven process of accumulation of capital, but at the same time, uneven process of what can be seen as uh, the growing potential for the emergence of gentrification as well. One more thing to mention uh, here is how much the concept of gentrification has also been pretty much um, changing over the years. Uh, even if we combine our uh, discussions to Western literature. So starting from, as many of you uh, may know, uh, 1964 publication by Ruth Glass, who pretty much coined uh, the term, uh, uh, the concept of gentrification. We get to see the evolution of this concept over the years, uh, over decades. And for example, by, uh, uh, why um, in the earlier era, gentrification was largely associated with neighborhood based processes, which were entailing incremental upgrading or rehabilitation of working class housing uh, to uh, cater for the need of incoming uh, affluent uh, populations. Uh, which were, uh, and also the location wise, and uh, all your discussions were largely based on uh, the inner city areas as the location for gentrification emergence. Whereas when you actually come uh, to 1996, when uh, Neil Smith was public, uh, 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 publishing his, uh, 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 his book, uh, The New Urban Frontier, he was basically you know, emphasizing uh, or uh, uh, revising his kind of, kind of position to indicate that um, it would be anachronistic now to exclude redevelopment from the rubric of uh, gentrification studies. So while previously um, redevelopment uh, gentrification was largely associated with um, incremental upgrading, now the larger scale uh, wholesale redevelopment is now seen to be part of uh, gentrification process. And 10 years later, Eric Clark, for example, also in a, in a, uh, uh, discussing that where gentrification doesn't necessarily have to, ha have to happen in inner city areas, uh, given that, um, um, according to Eric Clark, abstracting uh, this relation, especially the central the location issue, to define the process leads to a more rather chaotic conception of the process. So he kind of considers in a, in a, in a city location to be one of the many uh, 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 aspects of gentrification. And it doesn't have to be confined you know, to uh, a certain part of the city as long as it entails uh, reinvestment of capital that uh, accommodate the displacement of existing users of the land. So as you can kind of see, even if you combine uh, our discussion to um, uh, the Western literature that has been looking at the experience of you know, post-industrial industry cities of uh, North Atlantic, we get, also, we get to see in how the concept has been evolving over the years. And here, I guess, um, it'll be useful to understand um, how much um, um, it, the critiques of gentrification literature, uh, especially when it comes to thinking about the applicability of gentrification as a concept to uh, cities in the global south, um, many of these critiques uh, um, do not necessarily contest the decades-long evolution of the gentrification research in the North Atlantic context. Uh, so uh, you know, when you actually go through the literature, uh, produced by the critiques of you know, gentrification. Uh, uh, there's very enough, uh, it, it's pretty much you know, uh, accepted uh, 
that you know, the evolution of gentrification concept within the North Atlantic uh, uh, is something uh, that is, uh, well, I guess that, that, can be, that can be seen as acceptable. Uh, but this also is, it can be quite tricky because, um, for example, uh, Malutas in his uh, well-known publication that was published in 2011 was trying to emphasize the fact that you know, such concept of gentrification is uh, less likely to be applicable to southern European cities because of the contextual differences between northern Atlantic cities and uh, the southern European cities. But this can be all, uh, rather uh, uh, erroneous to some extent, largely because, as we also understand, there are there is a huge divergence uh, within North Atlantic cities. We all often talk about how city urban politics in the U.S. are quite uh, is quite different from the urban politics in the U.K., given the ways in which cities are structured, and also given the way in which um, um, uh, the state intervention can be observed uh, um, in urban politics. So. There is already this divergence and differences that can be observed within North, North Atlantic cities. Um, so if you kind of you know, assume that you know, the evolution of the gentrification concept within North Atlantic uh, cities to be uh, something that can be acceptable, I suppose you know, there's uh, more to be said about uh, the extent to which such concept can be uh, applicable to, uh, to the context that they may differ from North Atlantic cities. One question, the second uh, 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 part of um, my talk is really about um, gentrification as an endogenous process. By raising this question, is the linguistic absence to, uh, or linguistic absence of you know, gentrification as an expression to be equated with the absence of the process? Does the rise of concept precede processes of gentrification? And I guess you probably will be able to guess you know, my, what my answer is going to be. Um, and, and for me, you know, the absence of uh, the linguistic absence is not to be equated with the absence of the process. Um, a very interesting study, you know, uh, 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 briefly to mention here, is a study by Takashi, uh, Professor Takashi Machimura from Japan was you know, discussing how gentrification can be seen in Tokyo's context as to involve um, a unique set of players that involve you know, the state developers and also some of the rich uh, uh, and powerful elite uh, and investors. But without uh, uh, entailing a large scale um, district based in you know, a displacement, uh, since the vertical uh, expansion of you know, uh, urban space by means of accommodating in you know, high rise towers. Uh, throughout the 1980s, 90s, and, and 2000, uh, were open and you know, taking place in a way that was kind of in a, in a, in a very surgical manner, where uh, tower blocks are being inserted in existing neighborhoods without entailing the whole scale you know, uh, uh, transformation of the entire neighborhood, and therefore the displacement to be, um, to some extent, uh, minimized. Um, but this also can be in a, in an interesting way of understanding you know, what it means to think about gentrification, especially uh, when you compare this process with what can be uh, uh, observed in South Korean context. So in South Korea, the verticalization uh, has also been uh, uh, prevailing from uh, the 1980s uh, with, with the start of a joint redevelop redevelopment program, which was targeting uh, shanty towns in Seoul, they were accommodating a large number of low-income uh, um, uh, populations in, in Seoul. And such a joint redevelopment program was largely based on collaboration between property owners and developers, supported by various you know, uh, programs and, uh, coming up, coming up uh, from the state. And this was kind of proceeding to uh, uh, subsequent urban programs such as redevelopment of you know, low rise, medium rise condominiums to uh, uh, densify existing urban space, and the scale has become even larger. So the joint redevelopment program from the start uh, in early 1980s was basically creating a large scale wholesale clearance of existing shanty towns 
involving thousands of you know, local populations uh, to be subject to uh, uh, eviction. Um, and this was also some, uh, this can be seen to be quite similar to um, the new build gentrification. This is what I try to argue in my own publications. Uh, that is um, such a um, process of joint redevelopment in Seoul can be uh, seen as new build gentrification. Um, um, and th although in, in the 1980s, gentrification was pretty much in a, uh, uh, something that wasn't uh, uh, discussed or, or, um, or uh, exchanged in public media or uh, academic circles. Whereas in South Korea, um, we get to hear a lot more frequently the expression gentrification uh, being circulated um, in daily discourses and also public media. And this is, uh, a num these numbers indicate the frequencies of uh, the expression gentrification appearing in news report uh, outlets. So as you can see, uh, only once uh, uh, there was, I mean, the gentrification was appearing only once in 2010 and 11 in public media, whereas the numbers were increasing very sharply to reach 393 in 2015 and more than 1,000 times in 2016 onward. So you get to see, you know, wow, that's a big and you know, a surprising increase and explosive you know, attention given to gentrification. But in this case, a lot, a lot of these discussions about gentrification in 2010 uh, in South Korea was pretty much on commercial gentrification, looking at the, the fate and eviction of um, uh, pow uh, less powerful uh, commercial tenants. What is also quite interesting is um, with the proliferation of gentrification uh, uh, within South Korea in 2000, 2010s, national institution uh, that promotes the language of South uh, language of Korean uh, even uh, uh, try to uh, produce uh, the translated version of gentrification in Korean. So as you can see on the right hand side um, in Korea uh, from 2016, uh, uh, based on what the National Institute has tried to uh, uh, argue. Gentrification is uh, translated into uh, Korean and, uh, as Nemolim, which basically uh, uh, can be literally translated into eviction from one's nest or, or home. So I think this is an interesting way of you know, localizing um, gentrification as a concept uh, that can be uh, more uh, amenable to wider circulation. Now, going back to what I was saying earlier, um, although gentrification uh, has become a popular expression from 2010 onward, it doesn't necessarily mean it, the process of gentrification was non-existent before 2010. If you think about the way in which you know, uh, new build gentrification was uh, pretty much you know, prevailing from 1980s, as I was saying in the previous slide. Now, we, we can also think about um, these issues in connection with how gentrification in the West has been conceptually evolving as well. So just going back to uh, this slide that you were seeing earlier, uh, Neil Smith was only acknowledging um, the inclusion of redevelopment in the discussion of gentrification in 1996. So in this case, you can kind of think about how much the literature before 1990s uh, might not have been uh, engaging with redevelopment to be part of the gentrification process per se. And only after 1990s, you know, with the increasing awareness of how redevelopment can be only one form of gentrification, uh, we get to hear more about uh, making the connection between redevelopment and the process of gentrification in Western cities. And this has become more or less the norm of the literature nowadays uh, in the West. And we can also kind of see how such concept of gentrification when it comes to applying it to redevelopment could have been quite limiting um, outside the West as well. And this is uh, in a uh, and previous example of in you know, South Korea can be um, uh, uh, a testimony uh, to such limitation before 1990s.
So to sum up, uh, the term gentrification may not be widely circulated um, as uh, I was trying to argue with my colleague uh, in this uh, 2016 publication. Um, kind of, uh, so the term gentrification may not be widely circulated in the media and public discourses, uh, but the process of gentrification itself uh, was not so new. And this, is, this can be quite obvious when you also think of how Ruth Glass was trying to conceptualize gentrification, were, uh, trying to uh, 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 put forward the concept of gentrification in 1964. Uh, and then the, public, uh, uh, the coming to existence of the expression gentrification in 1964 doesn't necessarily mean, obviously, the process only became existent from 1964, right? And she was looking at what was going on throughout the 1950s, and therefore, in her publication in 1964, basically trying to you know, uh, summarize the process by uh, putting forward the concept of gentrification. So, in that regard, we can already understand how the concept, uh, how the process may proceed in a, uh, the uh, the emergence of a, a certain concept. Now. This is also quite in, uh, going to be quite interesting uh, when you look at uh, various you know, urban contexts, such as not only South Korea, but also uh, Hong Kong, where David Lay and his colleague uh, Sini Teo uh, were trying to argue how in Hong Kong, where gentrification was hardly not subject to wider circulation among you know, uh, uh, journalists or uh, and academics, they nevertheless uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that you know, there are processes which uh, can be uh, seen as gentrification. It's only the Hong Kong's particular uh, con uh, political, social, and economic context within which uh, such process of you know, uh, social injustice that was involving large scale redevelopment and displacement of local people not to be seen as you know, uh, socially unjust. And therefore, uh, such kind of a uh, uh, presence of cultural hegemony of uh, property leading to rather um, uh, a particular way of understanding uh, such urban processes um, without linking it to gentrification that is very much centered on the production of urban space and social injustice. Now, this, the second point I try to make uh, in today's talk is how much we need to understand gentrification to be working in tandem with other multiple urban processes. And this is pretty much building upon uh, the lessons uh, from Doreen Messi's uh, scholarship was, uh, here I quote Doreen Messi, trying to argue and, uh, say that the interdependence of all places and uniqueness uh, of individual places can be understood as two sides of the same coin in which two fundamental geographical concepts, uneven process, uh, uneven development, and the identity of place can be held in tension uh, with each other and can each contribute to the explanation of the other. Uh, basically, in, uh, trying to show how much it is important to have hierarchical and relational understanding of space. And if we kind of push this further, we can also think of how multiple processes are, are at work in a given urban space. And only gen gen gentrification can be only one of those many processes uh, that may exist, which basically you know, also again you know, further tells us the importance of looking at other processes at work that may hinder or facilitate gentrification. Now, let me kind of show you know, as an example, my own study from China's uh, Southern China, where I was trying to understand uh, the process of um, redevelopment uh, of, uh, of uh, an urbanized village uh, in Guangzhou. And here, what I was trying to say in my, uh, and this is uh, uh, referring to the 2016 publication from urban studies of mine, um, which was trying to you know, emphasize uh, the way in which this possession of people's uh, of village villages' rights uh, has happened as a precursor to gentrification that is put forward and proceeding uh, proceed uh, proceeded as state project. So in this case, the urbanized villages uh, redevelopment was largely based on the collaboration between uh, the village leadership and um, state and a developer. 
working also closely with uh, local uh, uh, state. And this was largely involving um, the uh, disposition of villagers' rights uh, uh, in order to make sure the villagers' land um, uh, can be turned into real estate property. So this process was also involving uh, pretty much uh, the commodification of land, uh, land in order to facilitate the, uh, uh, the inclusion of uh, the village space into the wider, uh, the real estate market of you know, Guangzhou and Southern China. Uh, and at the same time, the process largely involving uh, the workings of cooptation and coercion in order to make sure villages uh, uh, agree to this process. Um, some of them, uh, and here I refer to uh, both cooptation and coercion, largely because of the ways in which you know, the hegemony of property ideology operates, and all at the same time, uh, as uh, the, the violence of the state uh, uh, applies uh, to uh, control and, and, and uh, 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 to control the, uh, the, the decision uh, of villages uh, to make sure that you know, they are you know, aligned with the state interest. I think this is quite important largely because you know, when you actually look at uh, the literature uh, on how much gentrification can be or cannot be applicable to city or to, uh, to um, cities in the global south, we get to see two different positions, you know, as you can see uh, on this slide. And on the one hand, uh, a critique like Asher Gartner uh, will be uh, pretty much in in indicating that uh, while gentrification uh, may happen in cities like Mumbai, Rio, or Lu and Luanda, uh, they happen largely because those areas uh, have already become privatized, where diverse tenure regimes um, have already been flattened um, in order to create in a private tenure and displacement uh, becoming a relatively small scale. Whereas a large part of in a, uh, such cities in the global south uh, still experience uh, uh, complexities in terms of uh, the tenure uh, distribution and also the existence of non-private tenure uh, or non-fully privatized tenure, uh, basically becoming hindrance to uh, um, the emergence of gentrification. Whereas uh, a critic like uh, Tom Gillespie in his 2020 publication pretty much kind of indicating that Yes, it is. Uh, there is gentrification process occurring in uh, in in, the, in cities of the global south. Uh, it, it, especially when you look at the uh, ways in which uh, rent gaps emerge to facilitate incoming investment of capital in those in the places that are subject to you know, um, various types of development. But at the same time, he also you know, you know, uh, goes uh, uh, further to say. Uh, there are nevertheless various risks associated with customary land in, uh, in Accra, which was the case study uh, Gillespie was looking at. And therefore the state has sought to play an active role in producing the real estate frontier through urban redevelopment projects. So you can see a subtle difference or rather in a, well not subtle, I guess, and it's a rather in a, a clear difference between two perspectives. One, on, on the one hand, uh, um, there is a view to think of how much such uh, presence of non-fully privatized tenure uh, does become a hindrance and therefore is uh, not useful to talk about gentrification, while another uh, in a, uh, a viewpoint referring to the ways in which, yes, gentrification may exist, but we need to go further to think about how uh, such conditions as a uh, customary land right and, and non-private uh, non, uh, tenure uh, and, and so on, uh, do make a, a, a barrier to the rise of gentrification and therefore you know, the state and the working to basically erase uh, a lower the barrier to capital investment. So in this regard, I guess as, uh, my, the way in which I was looking at uh, the case of the you know, Chinese um, example earlier is pretty uh, more or less in line with uh, what uh, Gillespie was trying to uh, put forward. Uh, in other words, uh, we need to look at the multiple processes at work and therefore when discussing gentrification, we also need to understand how 
this process of gentrification can be working in tandem with a process of disposition or other, other processes that can be in operation uh, in social, economic, and political sphere. The next item, uh, uh, a topic to, talk, to think about is um, whose perspect perspectives count. Now, let me go back to the case of urbanized village redevelopment in China. Large, because the redevelopment process uh, in southern China targeting such urbanized villages uh, is largely based on um, the model of you know, collaboration between uh, villagers uh, and uh, uh, developers who sign a contract uh, to redevelop and in return, villagers get compensation um, and also uh, get a chance to uh, stay, uh, uh, stay put after uh, development. Uh, I mean, there are many other uh, 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 considerations to be given and uh, to understand in greater detail how this process actually turns out to be. But for, for the sake of today's discussion, the bottom line is villages uh, mostly get a chance to stay when it comes to such urbanized villages redevelopment in southern China. And this, this is the literature that you get to, uh, you get to read in a quite often these days, thanks to many critical researchers uh, who grow in numbers uh, uh, while looking at uh, China's urban processes. Now, this such model also raises an interest, interest, interesting question. You may see from time to time in a, uh, some in a statement that refer to how such involve, involvement of local villages uh, would produce conditions that can be quite different from what can be seen as a typical process of gentrification elsewhere, because these villages uh, get to stay in their own village without being displaced. If you look at this process from the villagers' perspective, obviously this is not quite the same as the usual uh, uh, suspect of gentrification elsewhere. But when you also when you look at this uh, a little deeper and uh, understand the uh, the population uh, structure within these urbanized villages, you get to see how much these villages villages are pre pretty much um, uh, heavily populated by uh, migrant tenants, uh, as residential tenants and commercial tenants as well. So the table on the left hand side uh, pretty much shows in a. Uh, the large presence of in you know, a migrant. You know. So this is a study you know, about 10 years ago, but already it, it, it has been you know, showing that uh, in many villages, uh, uh, migrants uh, uh, greatly outnumber uh, indigenous you know, villagers. So these migrant tenants are uh, almost without exception you know, being uh, evicted in the process of uh, uh, redevelopment of urbanized villages in Southern China. And when you think of this process, you can think uh, and from the migrant perspective, the whole process of villages redevelopment has produced in a, a condition that is akin to new build gentrification. So that's uh, something you know, that can be quite interesting, you know, uh, whether or not you know, one claims to be observing gentrification in these urbanized villages pretty much depends on whose perspective uh, uh, he or she will be taking. What can be also interesting here is um, how much we can we need to also conceptualize displacement. So this is the second topic you know, that I'm going to uh, uh, discuss. Uh, the, uh, the second, uh, the last topic that I uh, that I would like to discuss in today's talk. So going back to the previous case, and, and let me just uh, if I just briefly uh, touch upon what uh, Khan uh, was trying to argue in. Uh, in the publication uh, of 2020. It is, uh, and here and, and she's saying, um, it is shown that although uh, the state cooptation of local villages means that the direct displacement of original residents might not be an immediate outcome, gentrification induced displacement can also take place through more gradual and indirect processes. So basically the villagers 
Although they are staying put without you know, going through direct displacement from their villages, maybe going through indirect displacement or other types of displacement, which are not quite the same as direct physical displacement. And we need to also understand this as, a, as, as to entail a much longer time frame than you know, uh, what is typically uh, uh, observed in, in, in the literature that looks at a particular moment uh, in history. So this is what uh, takes us to think about uh, the need of complicating displacement at the scale of body and family. And here, um, uh, another interesting study is uh, the study by um, Yahweh Zhao uh, that came out in 2019, which was looking at the process of uh, rural gentrification by looking at the, uh, the increasing uh, appearance of guest houses uh, in touristic places. So in this case, the guest, ho guest houses, um, which are largely seeing the, uh, the investment by more affluent people from outside the village, as well as the investment by the villagers, some of the villagers themselves, will be also producing a situation in which local villagers uh, may not be necessarily become subject to direct displacement. Some villagers uh, uh, opt, uh, uh, choose to live elsewhere outside the village, but some other villagers may stay within the village and operate their own guest houses and uh, other supporting services uh, given to uh, uh, visitors and uh, investors. So in this case, basically, uh, not all villagers will be subject to such direct displacement. When also uh, and also in uh, many villages are, who are choosing to you know, live elsewhere are uh, seen to be uh, doing this voluntarily. Uh, now, what can be quite interesting from Yahweh Zhao's study here is the last point, the last bullet point. Um, there's a kind of you know, a, br a brief mentioning of uh, the complicated intra-household dynamics. That is, this the decisions made by the head of household in the absence of agreement by other household members, such as children and the elderly, who may experience unhoming, um, increasing detachment from their you know, and, uh, communities and homes. So in this case, you know, such detachment happens involuntarily for those children and elderly who are not taking part in the decision-making process uh, of their uh, household has. And in this case, uh, such you know, uh, the impact of uh, such um, uh, indirect displacement uh, was, uh, uh, of, of such you know, displacement and effect may happen on a longer, uh, uh, by only observing the process uh, 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 using a longer time frame rather than looking at the immediate aftermath of the house move uh, and, and the family decision making. So that uh, kind of takes us to think about what it means to talk about displacement, you know, uh, especially uh, when it comes to think about the intra-household dynamics and intra-village dynamics as well. And going back to the example of an you know, urbanized village, um, you know, many villagers may uh, choose to stay, may be able to stay put, but as my own study and many other studies have shown, there are processes of you know, both co-optation and, and, and state uh, coercion, which involves you know, state violence. And in that case, you know, many people may choose to stay put, but uh, possibly against you know, their, you know, their will, uh, especially when it comes to exercising their right. And such kind of situation will produce a, long, uh, a longer term detrimental impact, especially uh, uh, by producing uh, what can be seen as symbolic or phenomenological displacement that involves you know, one's feeling and effect you know, for their communities and housing. And when you think about this, and we can perhaps and critically engage with a study like you know, uh, this one you see, you know, which, which pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, kind of you know, provides a very use, an interesting way of understanding what it means to talk, talk about gentrification. Uh, so in this study um, that looks at um, large scale in a, uh, urban project 
in the city of Hanoi in Vietnam between 2013 and 2017. Uh, while the authors make a lot of interesting and useful points, uh, what is interesting conclusion that they make is uh, what I highlighted in gray here. Uh, so the paper evaluating five types of displacement on the city's outskirts, because displacement only occurs in marginal cases and generates limited feelings of social injustice, the term gentrification is of, of little use. So I guess you know, the question here is you know, to, what, to, uh, to what extent you know, such feeling of injustice can be genuinely uh, uh, emerging uh, or, or the feeling of injustice uh, has not been emerging in genuine sense. And if you kind of combine this study with what I was referring to in the previous in a slide, uh, the Yahweh Zhao's kind of indication of how much the uh, intra-household dynamics can be complicated that may produce a you know, feeling of you know, um, uh, uh, symbolic displacement or uh, feel, uh, the feel sentiment of uh, injustice. Um, I guess you know, we, we probably uh, there's a, in a room for more questions to be asked you know, when it comes to uh, uh, the understanding of um, the social injustice and how much this feeling has been incurred in a by those who are subject to uh, the project discussed in a project like this. So to summarize, you know, the scale and, when it comes to scale and temporality of displacement, um, it will be useful to think about, uh, and let me start from the third pillar point here, the everyday slow violence of gentrification that Kearns was you know, proposing in 2016, um, which was kind of pretty much involving the ways in which um, um, the everydayness, disruption to everyday life, you know, building upon into significant displacement pressure for marginalized groups and this takes a longer time frame to be uh, adopted in order to fully understand the scale um, and this uh, scale of uh, such violence and exercise. And also to think about not only the physical direct and displacement, um, uh, but also to think about the, the affective and emotional nature or the mater material rupture um, that, uh, it, that is part of a uh, displacement experience. And also to think about uh, the, the importance of looking at post-displacement experience of people. And here I, I refer to Zhang Wang's study uh, in 2020. And at the same time, the last bullet point that refers to uh, the increasing awareness of displaceability that Oren Iftakir was trying to you know, uh, put forward that looks at how a systematic condition through which spatial power is exerted by policy, legalities, and violence create a hierarchical uh, positioning of urban citizens, um, leading to some uh, citizens uh, experiencing greater degree of displaceability and therefore vulnerability. And I guess this is something we can also think about in Asian context as well. So to conclude, um, what, I, what I have tried to argue uh, in my talk today uh, are these. Gentrification to be, think, uh, to be seen as real, imagined, and possible. So yes, we get to see in a, in a, the actual uh, presence of gentrification in whichever way it is being defined. But at the same time, the increasing emergence of the conditions of in a gentrification, making gentrification a possible process that can emerge. Whether or not it is being contested, prevented, or uh, or are accepted depends pretty, pretty much on the way in which local politics you know, play out uh, that bring uh, a range of you know, players into uh, contestation and interaction. It is also imagined in a sense that you know, many policies are, look, uh, are looking at gentrification, producing gentrification effect. So you know, a typical example you know, that, that can be seen is Many uh, Chinese cities, which are uh, like in Beijing or in Shanghai, which are increasingly trying to expel or displace you know, uh, migrant and populations away from uh, city centers um, in order to you know, reproduce uh, uh, urban centers uh, to be uh, catering for the need of a you know, more affluent population and urban elite, as well as international uh, investors. I think that policy at the city level uh, uh, is also what can be seen as uh, 
uh, on the extension of uh, the gentrification ethos uh, being applied uh, to urban policy making. And in that regard, gentrification can be seen as uh, uh, both imagined and uh, possible. And we need to also think about gentrifications in plural sense rather than singular gentrification with a big G. And here, this is largely to uh, uh, emphasize the fact that we need to see gentrification in the global south and global east, not as variations of gentrification in the global north, especially when you think of how gentrification can be also an endogenous process that can emerge as uh, I was uh, referring to in the case of uh, Seoul, South Korea in the 1980s. Each gentrification is to be analyzed in its own right, historically, uh, contextually, and relationally. And gentrification continues to be of important consideration as it severs the relationship between community and people, involving the competition for space, using the state and businesses as agents that support the takeover by those more powerful and affluent. Competition for urban space is essential for the social reproduction of labor and the cons consumption space, uh, the consumption space that caters urban uh, 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 that, uh, accommodates urban amenities and housing, which are increasingly subject to commodification across geographies. Where well, gentrification is important to be considered largely because um, it's also uh, creating antagonistic relations between people, between citizens, and between community members who would have otherwise united uh, uh, to make claims for the right to the city by, uh, by producing uh, what Peter Marcuse uh, was referring to as a uh, social block from Gramscian perspective. So it create divisions within the social, uh, within a potential social block and therefore continuing the hegemony of capital. In Asia, there is a need of, uh, to introduce uh, displacement as a focal point of critical urban studies um, to capture the frontiers of gentrification at multiple scale of body, family, community, city, and et cetera. Too often, we hear, we hear stories of emphasizing the material prosperity, lifting people out of poverty and modernity, treating state-led and uh, redevelopment um, as societal progress, and therefore gentrification not to be uh, seen uh, uh, as uh, something uh, important to be considered in uh, public discourse and, uh, and policy making. Attention to displacement would offset such bias in the extent, in the extent in the scholarship and policy discourse. And finally, critical scholars are to be reminded of the purpose of applying gentrification framework. And here, what I'm trying to say is, uh, what is the purpose of you know, such studies? Is it to confirm the existence of gentrification, which is what we typically, we often come across in this uh, in the literature? Or is it to understand the rise of social injustice and the social economic and political mechanisms that give rise to such in injustice? And this is what I uh, uh, also uh, try to emphasize as well. Gentrification provides an analytical framework that analyzes the operation of the state, capital, class violence, and resulting injustice. But scholars have to be mindful of other urban processes working in tandem so that we get to have a healthy, um, and critical dialogue you know, between researchers working on gentrification and researchers working on other processes at work. Well, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you want to uh, uh, contact uh, for further inquiries, please feel free to do so by sending me email to, uh, to this email address and also uh, messaging me via Twitter. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Professor Sheen.